When it comes to the making of movies, I find one of the most impressive arts a, a path, or a uh, actor has to perfect is the art of using a blue screen. Y'all know who, what a blue screen is? Anyone? Okay. Here's how they do a lot of those newfangled special effects. What they do is they put up a blue screen. Don't oh, hold on. Not yet. Uh, they put up a blue screen. And, uh, and then it's blue on the ground as well. And, and then let's say you're, you're filming Jurassic Park 19 and, and you need to be laying on the floor while some dinosaur licks you. What you'll do is you'll lay on the blue screen and act like the dinosaur is licking you and, and then they sort of drop the dinosaur in later digitally. They fill in all the blue with, with computer generated graph, uh, images, CGI. And, and so you have to act in front of a piece of blue material and act like it's really happening to you when all you see is blue. And this is one of the, uh, the skills they've developed so that they can do things like if you saw Revenge of the Sith, uh, they had Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi fighting on top of a tower over the pool of lava that the tower was melting into. They weren't on top of lava. They were against a blue screen and that was all filled in later. This is a type of thing that I've grown up uh, watching in the movies, and I put together a couple of clips to show you some of these things. If you'll go ahead and hit play now. Like, I remember watching Jurassic Park in the early 90s and being there and watching this, and when the feet come down you go, and the whole theater shakes, you go, whoa, that's really a dinosaur. It's not, but it, it looks real, right? Or uh, the Lord of the Rings. The sound's not playing for some reason. This dude's named Gollum. You all, you all remember Gollum? Mighty Mouthful. <laughs> Looks real, right? It's actually a dude named Andrew Circus, and uh, he is in a white outfit with a bunch of weird looking dots. And then Yoda. You remember Yoda from the original Star Wars, this little like puppet just barely moving around? A and then you see this in the one of the new uh, Star Wars, and when I was watching this, when this happened, people started cheering. It was amazing. I didn't actually hear what happened because everyone was just, yay! Because Yoda's just taking out the, jumping around with a little itty bitty lightsaber. Very cool. And, and so these are the movies I grew up watching. Welcome to my childhood. And uh, I thought of this as I was thinking about this term that we've all heard before. You've all heard the term seeing is believing, right? Seeing is believing. If I can see it, I'll believe it. And yet, the majority of our perception of the world around us, while the majority of it's through our eyes, we see things and you know that little green frog looking dudes don't pull out lightsabers and jump around like that. You know that dinosaurs don't exist. Sometimes seeing is, is not believing. And when it comes to actually believing, I don't think seeing is enough. If you see it, do you really believe it? Do you trust it? How often do you see something online and you look at it and say, yeah, that was photoshopped. Uh, that can't be real. I, I, most of the time I see something on Facebook, it looks too good to be true. It is. Uh, if, if seeing is not believing, I think there's something that actually does lead to believing. And if we're going to believe in something, it's not what we see, it's what we touch. Right? The, there's an importance to touching something, putting your hands on it. And I think we see that in, in, part, in moments in our lives. When, when a mother delivers a child, does she stand at the window look in and say, yeah, I see my kid. Yeah, good. No! That mom wants to hold, wants to touch, wants to, the, that child, and then begins that very awkward and nervous dance as both sets of grandparents wants to hold the kid next, but you're not quite sure who's going to. Yeah, you want to touch the kid. That, that's what you want to do when you, when you have a child. When you think of uh, when you go through a hard times, uh, like a funeral or something like that, and you're at a visitation, what does everyone want to do when they get to the front of the line? You're going to hug them, right? You want to touch them, whether it's, it's, it's or even if manly, big old gruff hug or, or a handshake or something. That's the way that, that you know someone's really there for you. If you touch the, them, you want, you want to actually be there for them. And, and if you think of what is one of the most hurtful things that can happen, you ever go out for a handshake and the other person won't extend their hand, won't touch you? You ever have that happen? Yeah, it's a horrible sensation. Yeah, it, touch is important. Seeing, you know, seeing is important, but, but touch, if you really want to believe, you've got to touch it, right? You've got to touch, got to put your hands on it. 
And, and I think that's what we start to see in the Gospel uh, of John. If you start reading through the Gospel of, of John and start looking with, with eyes open towards the, looking for this touch thing, we, we see this. If you, at the beginning of the Gospel of John, it, be, it talks about how in the beginning was the Word and there was light. And, and, and what does the Word become? Flesh. You can touch it. You can, talk, you can see the Word, you can see the light, but you can touch a child that's been born. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And what is, how does he describe it? Does he say you can see it? No. He says you can feel it. It's like the touch of the wind as it goes across your skin. Jesus feeds thousands of people at a time, giving them something they can touch. He washes disciples' feet. He doesn't talk about how to serve. He, he touches their feet and says, this is how you serve. There, there's a touch here. You, you touch and you clean people where they are dirtiest. I think one of the reasons this comes up so often in the Gospel of John, this emphasis on, on touch, is that the Gospel of John is written about in the 90s. It's late in the first century. And it's written in a time when the people, well, it's been 60 years since Jesus, right? And the earlier Gospels don't have quite this sense of trying to figure out how to keep on going, even though Jesus hasn't come back yet. Like Mark, he doesn't really focus on this much, because Mark is the first Gospel written, and there's just, they're just, Mark is just hurried to get the story out. He's just writing it as quickly as possible. But John, John's had some more time to kind of chew on it. To think about it and to reflect. And now he is writing this for a community that they can't see the world around them and say, this is where Jesus is. It, 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 the world does not look like what they would expect for Jesus to be king, for Jesus to be ruling. And so what the Gospel of John is helping them do is see how what they can touch can help reinforce and form their faith. And I think we see this in what we read just a minute ago. When Thomas shows up with Jesus, what does Thomas want to do before he's going to believe? He doesn't want to see Jesus. He wants to touch Jesus. He wants to put his hand uh, on Jesus. And, and so here at the end of, of the gospel, when we have people sort of declaring their faith, the greatest testimony to Jesus, the, the, the single cleanest, most elegant confession of who Jesus is, my Lord and my God, comes when Thomas touches Jesus. It's not seeing is believing, it's touching is believing. And it's a very specific type of touch that, that Thomas wants, right? Thomas doesn't just want to say, I want to touch Jesus in general. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm not going to believe till I can shake his hand. What Thomas says is, I want to touch the wounds. I want to touch the scars. I want to put my hand in his finger. I want to put my hand up, up into his side. When, when, you, when a spear is stuck under your ribs, up towards your heart, that does leave a little bit of a hole. And um, G Thomas does not want some sort of phantom Jesus, some sort of ethereal Jesus. Thomas wants to believe in, in the Jesus that he has walked with for years, the, Tom, the, the Jesus that has the scars from their life together. And so for Thomas to believe in Jesus is not just touching Jesus at all. It's touching Jesus and knowing that this is the Jesus who died on the cross for me and forgave me. And it's, this is the person I am touching. That's how Thomas comes to this faith. And I think this resonates for us in this, this time, because we also live in a time when the world around us doesn't always look like we might hope, when seeing is not enough to believe, when we don't trust what we see with our eyes, when sometimes we just need to touch something to really believe in it. And yet, what do we touch? If we, if we say with Thomas, I'll believe when I touch, what is it that we want to touch? The Apostle Paul writes that we who are gathered in the name of Jesus, the church, that we are the body of Christ. This is something he writes of multiple times throughout the letters of the New Testament. We who are gathered here this day, we are the body of Christ. And we are each part of that body. And if I want someone to believe that Jesus has moved in our lives, in my life, and if you want to show that to me, what people want to touch is something that was broken and healed. They want to touch a scar, right? 
if the, for a scar is where something has been hurt and where by the grace of God it has been healed. When we show people and allow them to touch the places where we have, we have lost loved ones and still found joy, when they touch that scar, they can see that God does work in our lives. When, they, when, we, when our trust has been betrayed and we learn to love again, and people can touch that, that place in our lives and, and, and they can see how God has healed that. They can believe that God is active in the world. When lives have been broken by what is evil in the world and those lives have been rebuilt, that leaves a scar. And to touch that is to, is to see and to witness that God does change people's lives. You know, if, if I try to show you that God is working in my life, my life looks perfect, it doesn't look like I need God. But if I want to show you God is working in my life and I say, here's the scar from when I was broken and this is where God has healed me, you believe that, right? Because we all have our wounds. We all have our own scars. For Thomas to believe that this was the real deal, that this was Jesus, he had to touch this scar. And, and, and the thing about touching a scar is it feels weird, right? You all know I, I play with knives quite a bit. And, and I was playing with a mandolin. You know, sliced vegetables really thin. And it was a brand new mandolin. First time I used it, really sharp blade. I started slicing the mandolin. And then I got my thumb. And there's a piece of my thumb that kind of flapped there for a minute. And, and I just kind of band-aided it back on. And, uh, and it hurt. And it eventually did heal. And, and I got a scar there. And if I push on it, I don't feel it until I push just right. And then I don't like it very much. You got scars like that? I don't like it when people touch the scar on my thumb. And, and, and that's just a little itty bitty scar on my thumb. No, it did hurt. Uh, and, and if we start talking about allowing people to touch the scars in our lives, and I'm not talking physical scars, I'm talking about the emotional ones, that's going to feel a bit odd, isn't it? That, that's not something that, that, that's comfortable. But if I want to show you that God has worked in my life, I'm going to have to show you the scars and show you what has changed. And so the scars become a, now a wound is what becomes a scar. And if you have a wound in your life that is still open and bleeding, I hope that you are praying about that. And I hope someone else is praying with you and about that. But uh, once wounds healed, whatever that wound is, those scars then become what can drive our ministry. If you have found joy after the death of a spouse, that, that's a scar, right? And to go out to other people who are wounded and scarred in the same way, it's, you can be good news to them. When you can find a healthy relationship after a broken family, that, that's a scar. And to be able to go out and tell people, you can do this as well by the grace of God. When you can forgive and rebuild after being betrayed, you can show, go out and share that good news with others that they can do the same. For me, there was a time I went through, I felt isolated, alone, no friends, etc. Um... And that's an emotional scar. And to this day, you know, I, I have found community and friends in the church through following Jesus, and I give thanks for that. But that doesn't change that I got a scar from that time. And it still bothers me to no end to see someone eating alone. In the body of Christ, no one eats alone. You go, you don't let someone... Sit. That, that's, that's one of my personal things. I don't let people sit alone. It bothers me because I've been there. And, and so the scars that we bear can become the sources of ministry to others to show them, you know, God can work in your life here too. Being able to touch each other, being able to touch the body of Christ, you know, that, that can get highfalutin. So I want to leave you with an, a little bit of an experience of that. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I hate it when pastors do this to me, and uh, I'm sorry, but it's important. And, and shuffle towards each other. Everyone shuffle, shuffle. And close your eyes now. Close your eyes. Now fumble towards each other and touch something. Touch, touch, another, touch the person next to you. Somehow. You know, we see each other throughout the week, and that's a good thing. It's good to see each other. But what we need in this day and age is we need to know that our lives are touched by the love of Christ. We need to know that we are part of something bigger than ourselves, that God is there with us and for us. And so as you go through your week this week, when you see each other here, fellow members of this body of Christ, of this church, don't just see each other. Touch each other. Touch each other's lives touch each other's, share each other's scars, touch each other so that you might know and touch each other and that we might know together 
that God is never farther away than the touch of the people who love us. Go forth this week to touch and be touched so that we might more fully believe and proclaim with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Amen. You may be seated.